Welcome back to Let's Make a Game, a channel where we are making a computer role-playing game using the free Twine program and the Sugarcube format for Twine. So here we are at the start of our game. If you've been following along with these videos, this will be very familiar to you. And I choose to be a human. And then I'm given a choice to wade across the river or cross over the bridge, and I choose to cross over the bridge. And we see that there is a fierce monster guarding the bridge, and it demands an answer to its riddle. And it, the riddle is we can only be seen when the lamp goes away. And let's say that we know the answer to that riddle, and we learn that we are right, and the monster lets us cross the bridge. Now let's do that one more time, and we'll make the same choices. Choose to be a human. Choose to cross over the bridge. This time, same monster, still demands an answer to its riddle, but it has a different riddle. It says, I have seven windows, but only three can shut. And again, let's see that, let's assume that we know the answer. We give the answer and it lets us cross the bridge. So if you've seen the previous video, this will be very familiar to you with the difference that there are now far more riddles. There are actually uh, a total of 57 riddles. And what I'm going to do in this video is show you how I did that. And how I did that is with uh, a thing called arrays, which is a new type of variable, which I'm going to introduce to you now. So let's get into the code first. Now, let's imagine that you were making a game in which you control a city, and then there's, say, four or five enemy cities, and each of these cities has the same type of stats. So, for example, your city has a population, and then enemy city number one has a population, and so does enemy city two and three and four. And let's say there are things that can happen to the population. For example, there might be a famine, and the famine causes 10% uh, of the population to die in a given city. And let's say that applies to all of the different cities basically in the same way. Well, you have a problem when you're coding because let's say you make you might call your city population PH for population human, right? So PH is a particular number and that tells you how many people live in your city and then P1 is the enemy city and P2 is the second enemy city and so on and so on. Well, when you code for a famine for PH, you'd be, it'd be something like set PH equals, uh, you know, PH times 9 over 10 something like that. But that wouldn't work for if it's city, enemy city number one. Then you'd have to have P1 equals, set P1 equals P1 times. And then you have to do it again for P2 and again for P3. So what you would like is you would like to be able to sort of group all of these numbers together and give them some sort of commonality so that you can say, you can have the code that says, okay, change the population of the city that I'm talking about. Change the population of the city whose number is variable Z and, and make that times, times nine tenths. And that way you only need to write one line of code, not sort of four or five or six. Well, that's what, that's what arrays do. So... You can think of an array as a set of pigeonholes, right? These old-fashioned uh, light little post boxes, PO boxes that people used to have. And they start with PO box one and then two and then three and four and up to however, you know, whatever the largest number is. And so the whole set has a name and then you might want to do something to the 17th P.O. box in that set and you can do that. Or you might want to do something to a randomly chosen P.O. box in that set and you can do that. And I'll show you, I'll show you how that's done. Let me get into my notes. So, oops, well, I'll zoom in first so we can see what's happening. So the relevant the relevant variables are Rn, which is how many riddles there are to choose from, Ri, which is an array, 
and which is the text of the riddle itself. And then we've got R1, R2, and R3. R1 is the answer to the riddle. So each riddle has at least one answer, but some of them have two possible answers, and some of them even have three. So R2 is the second answer, if there is one, and then R3 is the third answer, if there is one. So let's go into um, the actual code, and I'll show you how to set that up. So the first thing you need to do is something like this. Set ri equals square brackets, uns uh, you know, end square brackets. That tells the computer that ri is going to be this special type of variable, which is an array. It's not a single number. It's not uh, a string of text. So if we'd done that, well, ri would just be a single number. Or if we'd done that, it would be text. But no, we're telling it it's a different thing. It's an it's an array. It's a set of it's a set of pigeonholes. It's a set of pigeonholes, and each of the pigeonholes has a separate um, has a separate value. And each of those values can be a string of text or a number. And in fact, some of them can be text, and some of them can be numbers uh, at the same time. But in this particular case, they're all going to be text. And then we've done the same thing with set R1, set R2, set R3. So, and then we have to put the values in, of course. So this is how we do that. Set ri square bracket one unsquare bracket to this text, cut me and I heal at once. So what that's saying is, okay, find the, find the set of uh, boxes that's called ri, then find box one within that, and put the value cut me and I heal at once into slot one. The next line is exactly the same thing except for it's a different st string and it goes in uh, box two. And putting something in box two doesn't have any effect on the value that's in box one. So box one still has cut me and I heal at once. And then we do the same thing to box three and four and so on until we've gone through as many as we need to, which is which is in this case 57. But of course, if I thought of another riddle or decided that a particular riddle was no good, I could easily, you know, get rid of one. And then we turn to the answers and we go look for R1 this time, look for that set of boxes, and then look for the first box. And in the first box, put the put a value which is a string, and that string is W A T E R water. Um, which is the answer to the riddle, cut me and I heal at once, of course. And then the answer to number two is ladder, dog, face, eyes. And each of these only affects that particular box. Set R17 equal to candle has no effect on boxes one to six or boxes eight and up. And that is the, you can see that these two actually have the same value, but we need to put it in separately each time because putting something in eight doesn't have any effect on seven and and vice versa and then of course we go on until we get to the end and then this is the same except it's the second the second answers now in most cases there isn't a second answer there's only one possible answer and so i could have left that blank but i find it easier to just put something like xxx which is just sort of lets me know that there's no second answer and so we can see that some of them, some of them have have two answers, and some of them don't. And then there's the third answer, and of course, even fewer of them have three answers. So actually, most of that is xxx, but there's a few, a few that have three possible answers. Now, I will just briefly say this isn't the most optimal way to do it. Normally, you wouldn't have four separate arrays you would have a single array with both the question and all of the possible answers. But to do that, you need to work with slightly more complicated arrays. Instead of having a single row of boxes, in other words, having one dimension, uh, 
and you can you can name a box with a single number, you would need to have at least two dimensions. So it's sort of more like a grid, and then each box in that grid is named by two different numbers. But don't worry about that for now. I've just I've decided that I want to sort of teach you about arrays in the simplest way possible first, and then we'll we'll get on to two-dimensional arrays later. So, but just to let you know that you can have two-dimensional arrays, you can have three-dimensional. There's no I don't think there's any upper limit to the number of dimensions you have, although normally you you wouldn't have more than three or four. Um, but what I've done here with just a series of one-dimensional arrays, four different one-dimensional arrays, that's probably not the most optimal way to do it, but it is the way to do it that is simplest in terms of uh, the type of arrays that you need. So I've got, we've got the data, all, all of the data is in its proper boxes. And the other thing we need is we need the, we need to know how many possibilities there are. So I've set, I've, I've decided that that will be the variable Rn, which is just a normal type of variable, a single number set to 57. And then A is which riddle are we using this time? And that is set to random, which is the thing we learned about a while ago. Just a random number between 1 and Rn, between 1 and 57 inclusive. Now, I could have made this simpler. I could have deleted all of that and just done this. Right. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Set A to a random number between 1 and 57. So why, why do it in this more convoluted way of having a variable and then and then setting it setting another variable to something between 1 and 57. Well, the reason I've done that is because in this uh, in the game as it is now, there's only one place where you choose which riddle to use. But if the game were to expand, there could be lots of places. There could be another um, monster or character or whatever that asks you a different riddle. And again, I would need to choose which riddle they wanted, and I would probably choose that by random one to Rn. Now, if I, let's say I had gone one to 57 here, and also random one to 57 in that hypothetical other place, and then let's say that I wanted to change the number, well, I'd have to change it in every single place where I'd, where I'd put something like this. I'd have to change it from 57 to say 56 if I deleted one. Whereas the way I've done it here, I only have to change it in a single place. I can change that to 16 or whatever it may be, 58, whatever it may be. And that then every time it says random one to Rn, it'll automatically adjust to the new value of Rn. Now, in this particular case with the game as it is, that doesn't matter, but I think it's good to get into habits that will be useful once you start doing bigger games, if that makes sense. So that's why I've done, that's why I've done it in that unnecessarily convoluted way. Um, and then I'll just show you how we, how we work with that information when we get to cross over the bridge. We can see that, as before, if R equals 1, which means if the um, player has chosen to be a dwarf, he smites it with his axe and wins. If you're an elf, if the player's an elf, the monster hurls you to your death. And this is the bit we want here. Otherwise, it demands an answer to its riddle. And I've got dollars $RI, square bracket, dollars $A, unsquare bracket. Now, that just means go to the set of boxes, which is called RI, go to the the number A box in that, find what's there and print it. In some um, print in the sense of display it on the screen, not in the sense of print it on a printer. Um, in some languages, 
in some programming languages, you'd have to have a special command, something like print or something like that. But Twine knows that if I just give a variable like that, if I just name a variable, it's, it's saying find the value of that variable and then display it on the screen, which in, in computer terms is called print just for historical reasons. Um, probably because in an old language called basic print meant display something on the screen. Um, it's a bit confusing now we have printers, but that's what it means. And then it's exactly the same as before. There's a text box. We've gone through this in the previous video. There's a text box and a button, and it takes you to, um, takes you to the next screen, which has also been changed slightly. Now, here we are with the variable Z being what the player entered on the previous screen. So the main bit of this is if Z, i.e. if the player's answer is R1A, i.e. if it's the value for the array R1, which is the first answer, if it's the number A, um, the number A box in that array, if Z is equal to that, or if it's equal to whatever's in R2, or if it's equal to whatever's in R3, then we set Z to one, which means um, we're, we're setting a flag uh, that they've got the answer right, otherwise set Z to zero. And also because when there isn't an answer, I've put XXX just for myself, if the player happened to know the code of the of the game and was trying to cheat by typing XXX, we'll set Z to zero. Um, so Z is either zero or one now, and if Z is one, then that means that we're right, and if Z is two, excuse me, if Z is zero, then that means that they're wrong. So let's do an example. Let's look at an example of that. Let's say that A Let's say that A, we set A to a random one, between one and Rn, let's say we set it to 20. Then we know that when it prints Ri bracket A, unbracket, it'll, it'll say, I know what everyone else is missing. And then we know that the answers are going to be a thief or XXX or XXX. In other words, there's only one possible answer. So when we go to, when we're on this screen, this command means it will display, I know what everyone else is missing. And then the player gives their answer and it sends that answer as Z to the page called answer, which is this one. If the player's answered XXX, set Z to zero. Otherwise, if Z equals R1A, well, we know that's going to be thief because we looked that up. So in other words, if Z equals thief or Z equals XXX or Z equals XXX, set Z to one. But it only goes to this one if it hasn't gone to this one. In other words, it only looks at this code here if Z isn't XXX. So it's saying if Z is XXX, do this. Otherwise, if any of these things are true, do this. Otherwise, set Z to zero. So what it's saying there is, in this particular case, it would be saying if the player puts XXX, set Z to zero. If they put thief, or XXX or XXX, but that would never come up. Set Z to one, otherwise set Z to zero. In other words, if they've said thief, they get, you are right, the monster lets you cross the bridge. And if they've said anything else, then you're wrong and the monster throws them to their death. And that is how arrays work, or at least one dimensional arrays, the ones that we're gonna talk about so far. There is one thing else that I wanna tell you very, very briefly, and that is, if it's a small array, this is going to be useful. So 
you notice that what I've done is I've, as I say, I set ri equals an empty array, which is what these square brackets mean, and then put that in box one, that in box two, that in box three, that in box four, and, and so on. Whoops. Hang on. Sorry, I've... There we go. There is a quicker way to do this. We could get rid of that, and we could get rid of all this, And we could do something like this. Set ri equals um, I can't remember exactly what it says, but oops, and so on and so on. So in other words, instead of setting it up as an empty array and then putting uh, putting the, the values in each one on separate lines, we have a single line which says set ri up as an array, which is nothing, cut me in a hill straight away, whatever the text of the second riddle is, whatever the text of the third riddle is, and so on until the end. Now, why did I put these two quotes at the beginning? Well, because the first, um, the first, uh, also, sorry, I should say that these could also be numbers, but in this particular case, we're dealing with text, so I just put that to mean a, an empty text string. Um, the reason I did that is because the first variable or value doesn't go in box one, it goes in box zero. And I find it easier to, to just work with box one up and ignore box zero, but computer programs generally treat zero as sort of the first the first value. So um, I like to put blank or sometimes I put null or something like that just to remind myself that there's nothing there. Um, so why wouldn't we do this all the time when it's so much um, more compact we could get that on a few lines whereas we've got we have to have a separate line for each for each answer. Why wouldn't we just put it in one big list? Well the answer is because if it's big like this, if it's got 57 or anything like it, um, elements, it can be a little bit difficult. Like imagine, imagine if I had to find the 27th one of those. I'd have to count by hand, wouldn't I? I'd go, hmm, that's zero. I mean, let's, let's assume there's a null there. That's zero, that's one, that's two, that's three. And hopefully I wouldn't miscount by the time I got to 27, but it's very likely and it just sort of makes things harder when you're trying to, if you need to change it. And you probably will change it because you probably think of another riddle or find another riddle somewhere that you like or, you know, something like that. Find that you've accidentally put the same riddle twice. Um, and so if it's small, if it's if there's like four or five elements, I would say it's it's fine to do it that way. Always remember to put that null in there, but if it's something like If it's something like that, I would say that's fine because you're not really going to lose track of where you are and that with that small number, but with a large number, I would recommend against doing it. And so that's why I did it in the in the more um, the more convolute well, it, I, the way that requires more space and takes you know takes up a lot more memory and stuff. Okay, so I hope that was of interest and or use to some of you and I will leave it there and I hope that you will tune in next time.